chamber music, performing, and the joys of life with Rufus Olivier. Stay inspired. So Rufus, I just wrote down a few quotes um, from your interview that I was gonna highlight here. Um, a few that really stuck out was, no matter what you think of your teacher, they play better than you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, always, I always feel like, you know, you're always getting some uh, young person who's, you know, a little full of themselves a little bit. And all I'm thinking, I'm sitting there thinking, well, you know, yeah, I may be nothing to you, but I'm better than you. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm like, your teacher knows more than you do, so there's something you're going to pick up from that, you know. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know? Another one was, of course, listen to your teacher and practice. <laughs> practice, yes, yes. Uh, I, 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 I remember my first lesson with Breidenthal, Dave Breidenthal, and we're sitting and we're just sitting talking, just having a chat, and I've been playing, just talking about lessons. And he says, yeah, I can, I can help, but you have to trust me, you know? And um, you have to trust me and do what I say. And I was in, you know, because I admired him so much. I mean, if he said walk off a bridge, you know, it'll, it'll make you better. I was ready. I was ready to go. So yeah, you have to you have to trust your teacher, otherwise, pointless. Yeah. Another quote that you shared in story, Rufus, was around uh, an orchestra rehearsal, and uh, you mentioned, "Don't speak unless spoken to. Just sit there. <laughs> if no one talks to you, like the conductor, for example, you're ex you're a success." <laughs> oh. Yeah, the secret of my career is practicing the art of invisibility, you know, is, <laughs> yeah, um, I have this rule, if the conductor doesn't hear it, I didn't do it, okay, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not going to bring up something, I mean, I could fix something, but um, let's get through the rehearsal, and, and uh, you know, I'm just not talking to you, not saying this, then, then you're fine. You're doing well. Don't I don't I have feel no need to bring any attention to what we're doing in our in our section, so to speak. You know, we just want to do our jobs and go home. Yeah. Another one, Rufus. If if you're not going to make music, don't play. Otherwise, you're just making noise. <laughs> oh. Well, you know that comes from a, a, a wonderful woman. Her name was Linda, was Linda Hill, and I think I was in. I was in high school when I was playing with a really fantastic group uh, headed by a man named Horace Tapscott. It was the Pan-African People's Orchestra, Ark, the Ark, we called it. And um, I remember, um, you know, I was playing bassoon, and in this group, there was, um, I, I don't even know if I can call it jazz. I don't know what to call it. It was... Um, out of the box, okay? Modern music, very, and all the composers who, um, all, of, all of the composers who wrote a lot of these tunes were local. They were living in my area, living in Compton, living in Watts, and we would do these concerts. So I remember uh, having a little rehearsal, and then everybody would take a solo or something like that. I'll never forget Linda just stopping the whole rehearsal and screaming at every the people. You know, you're playing your brains out. You're doing your thing. You think you're, and she just screamed, "If you're not saying anything, don't play." <laughs> and that hit me like a brick. You know, if you are not saying something, just don't play. Play the tune and sit down. But if you have nothing to say, don't stand up and take a solo. You know, and that somehow was pasted, imprinted in my brain. And so since that day to this day, whether I do it or not, whether I succeed or not, my goal is to say something with my instrument and um, it's to say something. Now, yeah, I get paid to, to play every night, 
but I still don't, I don't treat it that way. It's like I have to say something or attempt to say something. Sometimes I fail, you know, but at least the attempt is there. And at least at, at this level that we're playing at, even if you're not over the moon, you're not speaking the language to the people, it still has to be correct. So there's, there's a certain level you have to maintain. But uh, the attempt is to say something. Otherwise, I, I, I'm in the wrong field. You know? And that's the way I feel about it. So. It's my own beliefs. You know? Another quote, Rufus, was, be true to yourself and be you. <laughs> I love that one. Yeah. Well, if it doesn't get you arrested, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah, um, you know, there, there, there are parameters. I mean, let's say musically, um, you want to play Mozart, you want to play Beethoven, you want to play Schubert. There are parameters. You, you can't be Rufus when you're playing Mozart. You have to be Mozart. You have to be Rufus playing Mozart. You have to be Mozart playing Rufus, you know. So there are parameters musically, and uh, your teacher helps you find these parameters and studying and whatever. So um, working inside that box and not, not straying too far from what is correct for the time, um, sure, you can interject your ideas, but you have to be careful. And uh, if you throw too much of yourself in there, you're you're not really being true to the composer. So it's you're walking the line. It's it's a fine line, a fine line. And, but when you're not playing, you know, let your freak fly. <laughs> do what you want to do, you know. <laughs> but yeah. And then another one was choose your path if it doesn't choose you. Did I really say that? Mm. Um, you know, um, yes, yes. Um, I've seen, you know, uh, I think about, you know, my son. He's, he's a very diverse person. He does everything he likes to do, and he does them very well. And they're so different, you know. He's he's done everything, and he does them well. And uh, he's I've learned, I've learned from him, you know. I've learned from Flora up there, and uh, she she does what she wants to do and, and enjoys what she does, you know. And uh, these these folks, so yeah, you know, Michael, he volunteers, you know, he does things, and he's chosen these things. So yeah. You choose, choose your path. And then another one, Rufus, was being a bassoonist is the best job. It's 45 years of exhaling for money. <laughs> 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 mm. You know, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> so much more than that. <laughs> it, no, but it is. You're right. You know, um, and, you know, I'm at, at this position, at this point, you know, in my career, I call it the twilight zone. At this point, um, it is, uh, you know, when I think about it and the experiences I've had uh, and the things I've heard and the people I've played with, I just don't know another way to, to get that. And so, uh, fortunately, I can, I can say that, um, honestly, it uh, has been. Um, I don't know if I would have chosen the bassoon, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but it's, the bassoon is, is, a, is somewhat of a, a struggle. It's a, it's a struggling instrument. It's, um, you know, I always thought the bassoon was a the instrument that was left behind by the aliens that made the pyramids, you know, <laughs> I don't think, I don't think this instrument is actually for humans. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, there's not enough fingers on your hand, number one. And so, um, uh, but yeah, and but that's striving, that struggle, that human struggle in, in, in the instrument. Um, when you, I won't say, when you conquer it that day, it makes you feel good, you know, because you have other days too. But yeah. <laughs> 
So Rufus, I wanted to dive in about starting music groups and why we should play more chamber music. And you mentioned, uh, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated and you can do this musically. And, you know, don't step on other solos. And it's a great way to learn these things in chamber playing. And um, I was reading about you, Rufus, that you're the founding member of the Anchor Chamber Players, the Midsummer Mozart Orchestra, and the Stanford Wind Quintet, among others. Could you share with us more on how you went about starting these chamber groups for anyone interested in doing this and why it's so important to play chamber music? Yes. Um, well, I didn't, I mean, I was in these orchestras. I didn't, I'm not responsible for starting them, but um, I, I, I did have a group I did start, which was, I called it the Olivier Ensemble, right? And that lasted about one concert. But it was the best concert I'd ever had in my life because, you know, I had some incredible musicians who are all psychotic and uh, they can only play together once. <laughs> but they were incredible. It was all that was worth it. But um, most of the groups, um, let's take Anchor, for instance. Anchor Chamber Players was a group started by the Anchor Beer Company. Fritz Maytag of Maytag Washer and Dryer bought Anchor when it was failing, and he he revived the microbrewery. He pretty much made the microbrewery in San Francisco. And um, his wife was an oboe player. Our oboe player, our assistant principal oboe player in the opera, was her teacher. And one day he said, could you put a group together to play for a high school booster to raise money? So we had an octet. Everyone in the, you know, the, the whole the whole wind section, we did a concert. And he liked it so much, he said, we have a group. And he he funded a group for 10 years, the Anchor Chamber Players. He, he uh, said we could name it anything we want. We could do whatever we want. He would take care of all the PR, do all the work. And, um, you know, piano, deliver, whatever you needed. And we decided to name it the Anchor Chamber Players. You know, um, a great pianist, Robin Sutherland was our pianist. We had, I mean, it was an amazing group. Um, we even had a jazz whistler at one concert. You know, we had, we had a Roy Bogus write a piece for quintet and jazz whistler. That was unbelievable. So, um, and then the, the Stanford Quintet was started by uh, Alexandra Holly, our flute teacher at Stanford. She was just giving a, she has a series, and uh, Avidis, and she wanted to have a quintet, and she was looking for some players, and they said, well, you know, the staff of Stanford was pretty much the woodwind section of the opera. She said, why don't you just use everybody here? So we played one concert, and she liked it so much, uh, she got the school to form the Stanford Woodwind Quintet. So a lot of my success has been being in the right place at the right time. You see, uh, things like that. And so uh, Stanford and Anchor and Mitzvah Mozart, that was just a joy. Uh, incredible. Uh, George Cleave was a conductor of that. Uh, George Cleave was a assistant to George Zell. But his, his Mozart was, uh, it, it, it almost, I almost am not, sometimes I, I wish I didn't play for 20 years with George and that orchestra because I am so spoiled. I am so spoiled. If I get a conductor that doesn't know what he's doing, I'm going crazy, you know, because I know what this is supposed to sound like. I know how good this can be. And oh my goodness, so that I'm a little spoiled that way when it comes to the, the Mozart experience. But the Mozart or the chamber music playing, um, before I was in the opera, before I was in the ballet, I was second bassoon in the symphony, San Francisco. Well, every Monday was a day off. And every Monday, some of us in the orchestra, the second winds, we formed a quintet. And every single Monday for three or four years, we played in that quintet. And that was to keep our interest and our chops and everything going. 
you know. And so it's the same in school, uh, in university, when, when a wind player is sitting in the orchestra and they're rehearsing the string players, they're just sitting there. They, you know, if they could have more of this chamber music for the wind players to actually have something to do. There is so much music for, for wind groups. It's ridiculous. So um, uh, all of this really hones you. I had the pleasure... I was with the, when I was a student I, uh, in Los Angeles under the Philharmonic, my, uh, we had a Los Angeles Philharmonic woodwind quintet, and I was fortunate enough to have my own teacher coaching, David Breidenthal. You imagine having a bassoon player coaching a quintet, and he's whispering things in my ear, saying things, little things, you know, adjustments, this and that. This is priceless. It's absolutely priceless. So, um... I, uh, the chamber music will, will hone your skills. And when I sit in a big orchestra, it could be 30 people or 130 people, I pretty much treat it like the woodwind quintet. I, I, pre I kick the ball the same way, whether I'm 10 yards from the goal or 50 yards from the goal. I kick the ball the same way. So if I'm in that orchestra, I tr I'm treating uh, it as if it's a chamber music situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. The chamber music will help a wind player uh, like you wouldn't believe. Rufus, I was reading about your soloist performances as well, and in the United States and Japan and France, and wanted to ask you about any like stories about um, a particular performance soloing or you know um, a goosebump moment that you could share with us about one of those concerts. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it was here. It was, it was actually at San Francisco State. We were doing uh, Grammys in the schools. The Grammys in the schools, all uh, they basically are there to teach young people the business of music. And so you have all of these really gifted high school students. Uh, and, and when I mean gifted, I mean they're really gifted hip-hop, it doesn't matter what genre. And so the ballet orchestra was there to show our side of the business, you know, the, um, the uh, orchestra side of the business. And so this one year, they said, uh, hey, could you, could you do a concerto? And so, uh, oh, hi, Larry. And so uh, he said uh, uh, we were going to play the, uh, the Vivaldi Concerto. And so the Vivaldi Concerto in E minor or something. So I, I get to the school. It's like an hour before the performance. And we're just going to run through it and go through it. And <laughs> they start playing. And they're starting to play the Mozart Concerto. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I leaned over to, I said, was I supposed to play the Mozart concerto? He said, yeah. I said, okay. I thought it was the Vivaldi, you know. No, Mozart. Okay. So we played the Mozart concerto that day. <laughs> but the best part of that day, and like I said, these are all kids from every stretch, incredibly diverse, beautiful as I'm leaving the stage, one of the guys, a hip-hop guy, as I'm walking by him, he says, way to go, dog. And I thought, well, that's the greatest compliment I ever had. Way to go, dog. I love it. To this day, I love that. <laughs> some young guy, some teenage kid, way to go, dog. You got to some guy, some kid, you know? And I, I feel that was... Biggest compliment I ever got. Way to go, dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rufus, I wanted to ask you about living outside of the city and, um, you know, just uh, with your music work and then also just with life. And, and wanted to ask, what do you love most about living outside of the city and what inspired you to live outside of the city? Well, I grew up you know, in Los Angeles, 
in, in right in the heart of the city. And um, when I came up to San Francisco, um, well, the first thing I noticed, this was in 1977, it was st it's still, it was expensive. <laughs> it was very expensive. And um, so I ended up actually, I've never really lived in the city. I've lived, always commuted to San Francisco. But uh, especially when I had the children, the, the, my children, um, there are not a lot of front yards or, or backyards in San Francisco for kids to play in and do things. And so I basically chose to live out of the city for my, my kids to just be free to do their thing without any fear. And, um, and I, li I actually like it myself, you know, uh, I, I've been working in, in that building for 44 years. So, uh, you know, when I leave the, when I leave the city, I can, I can, I just feel myself just, just chilling out, you know, coming back and, uh, put on my overalls, grab a straw, you know. <laughs> Better have the overalls. They're very functional. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, just, just have a completely different way of, um, life mm -hmm. and, um, and different people, you know. I like I like a lot of different types of people. Not just hanging out with musicians all the time. Like, you know, just interest. Everybody's interesting. They're just interesting people. Mm -hmm. So, so we're in Rufus's home right now. I'm. Yes. I'm. I'm. I'm not going to tell you. This is undisclosed location. I don't no. remember. <laughs> we did an interview years ago. At your back porch of your home, as I like to do interviews, I like to do interviews where people usually work. But uh, interestingly, uh, before I finished video, you would walk down the hill to the pasture to take care of your horses. I remember. I remember. That was a great day. Yeah. And I, as I approached the house, I heard all this bassoon work. And it was your son practicing. Right. Right. And he's, he's going to take over now, I'm sure. Yeah, well, you know, I played with my son in the opera for four or five years. He was my second bassoonist for um, four years. I, uh, two, we had two bassoonists, and they took leaves of absence. My son played. He played with me in the ballet, he played with the opera. And uh, he still plays the bassoon. But he's actually a uh, San Francisco policeman. And a army reservist. <laughs> he's the only, he's the only um, policeman I think dressed in all of his gear to conduct the ballet orchestra at Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and uh, I remember that. How are you? That's great. All right. Are you going to tell us about uh, the Never Cry Wolf? Never Cry Wolf um, was a, a, a Disney movie set in, um, a, where was that? Alaska? And I, I don't know. Anyway, a Disney movie. And um, there was, uh, the whole premise of, of, of the Disney movie was that the farmers were killing wolves because they thought the wolves were killing their cattle or animals. And the scientist goes there, may have been Alaska, he goes there to see what's really happening and he finds out that uh, the wolves are not killing the animals but the wolves are actually surviving on rats and things like that in the bush. But the interesting thing about the character is the character is a bassoon player. And so how I got to play, be the bassoonist for that character, again, I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, we were recording, I was at Lucas Skywalker, and we were recording the soundtrack for that movie. It was a huge orchestra. This has been 110 people sitting there. And we record the whole 
the whole soundtrack for Never Cry Wolf. And as I'm walking, apparently the, the director, Carol, he's, he's just not into that soundtrack. He doesn't, you know, they record, hire all these musicians. He didn't, he wasn't happy with the soundtrack. So as I'm walking by the booth, he go, he points, he says, who is that guy? And they said, oh, that's a that's a bassoon player. Get me that guy. I want that guy. And so <laughs> a few days later, they called me to a little bitty studio in Russian Hill. And it's Mark Isham. We had never done a movie. Mark Isham, Adler, Todd Bogohod, these three writers and producers. They say, we're going to make another soundtrack to Never Cry Wolf and we, we want you to be the bassoon. So they put me in a room and they play, they just they just start um, doing the film. It says every time he plays, you play something. You just make up whatever you want as long as it's in D flat minor or something. And uh, <laughs> he said, so basically I sat in front of a screen and just played and every now and then the movie director would say, could you go to the top of the horn and go over the horn? Over, like, I said, sure. So that's where, if you listen close, you'll hear notes that are being bent over the horn. I'm bending notes down to another thing. And uh, that was direction from the movie director. But it was basically just sitting and... There's not a lot in the movie, but I must have sat in that booth for four days, you know, for four or five hours a day, you know, just playing by myself to a, to the movie. And so um, that's how that came about. Um, just, again, I was in the right place at the right time. And, uh, you know, who knows? But that's how that happened. It sounds so cool. <laughs> and the mix of art and improvisation and freedom, but within the structure and wow. Within the structure, yeah, you have to be within the structure and whatnot. And but you do your thing, basically, within the structure. You know, um, playing, being creative inside the lines is, I think it's very, very, I think it makes you more creative um, when you have when you have these little rules you, you just can't go off the cuff if you can be creative inside those lines you really have to be creative you know what I mean it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you just can do you have to really dig really deep to go there because you, you have to be within these guidelines things like that that's never, never cry wolf. That, uh, that um, movie, I didn't see it for. I mean, I, I didn't look at it for maybe five or six years until uh, somebody gave me a DVD of it and I watched it. But uh, um, that movie is cherished by people who love the earth. You know, um, uh, 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 ecologists and things like that. You know, because it's basically saying, you know, you don't have to go around killing everything. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, don't destroy all of this beauty around us. That's basically so, um, you know. It, let me tell you, you hear these presidents, and they're always talking about a legacy. I'm going to make a legacy, a legacy, legacy, legacy. That's so much crap. You don't know. You absolutely don't know what people are going to remember about you or what you did. You just have to do what you do every day. You don't know what's going to happen. You can't say, okay, I want people to remember me like Beethoven. It's not going to happen. You just do your thing. Sometimes something sticks. Sometimes it doesn't. And you, and you just walk away. You, you know, um, yeah, you can't make a legacy. You can't divine a legacy. And any, anybody, presidents, anybody, think they can. They're, they're, they're only fooling themselves, you know? It doesn't work. 
have no idea. You know, um, you're just doing what you do. Um, you're just doing what you do. So Rufus, in your interview, I loved your approach to music performance nerves and you know, just going with the flow and embracing things that come up. So I wanted to ask you about, you know, speaking out positivity, joy and love and where this positivity approach to nerves evolved from. Oh, um, it's hard to remember what I said. But um, I, I'll tell you what I think about that. You sure. Know? Uh, I had this discussion with um, another bassoonist who was going to play the Mozart. And um, I just don't think you should put yourself down out loud to yourself. Mm -hmm. Or I don't think you should say, oh, my God, I'm, I feel crazy. Oh, I don't know if I can do this. You could feel that. You will feel that. You are feeling that. I just don't think you should put it out, out of your mouth. I don't think your ears should, should, I don't think your ears should say, I can't do something. You know, even if you're thinking it, you're only reinforcing it when you say it out loud. And when someone, um, if I'm standing about to walk on the stage to play something, and somebody asks me how I'm feeling, well, I'm going to lie, okay? I'm going to say, I'm fine. <laughs> that's what my ears need to hear yes. my ears yes. need to hear me say I'm fine you know I'm not going to say my knees are knocking you know I'm going to say I'm fine I'm fine I'm going to keep saying it until I start to believe it you know and so uh, uh, so that's my advice you know and as far as the nerve thing with that is if you can prepare as you can prepare as hard as you can. That really helps. Not um, it just just to know that you really tried really helps you. And say, well, you know, I'm so. I remember I was playing somewhere. I was in the. I was a kid, of 17 or 18. I was going to play the first movement of the of all the control, the L.A. Philharmonics. You know, Sidney Harps is conducting. Zubin Maiden standing in the wing. And I remember I was in the elevator with the great clarinetist, Michelle Zukowski. We're in the elevator together. And she said, are you tired? I said, I'm exhausted. She says, then you're ready. <laughs> this is good. Then you're ready. I said, you, you're, you're wiped out from practicing. You're wiped out from everything you can do. Then now you're ready. You know, it was just us in an elevator. And so uh, I'll never forget that. You just you work as hard as you can. And um, no matter what's going on, your body will take over if it has to. And let's say you, um, I always make an effort, if you're playing a new piece especially, or a piece, the first page is so important. The, the first page, getting through that first page before you to really just nail it into your body because that's where your confidence comes from. You nail that first page. When you turn that second page, your confidence is a little higher, okay? Uh, if you fumble through that first page, you might, so that, I always feel like if I, that first statement, that first page of music, if I could get, just nail it, then this is only going to stack up. And by the time you get to that third movement, you know, you know you're know, you on top of the world. But uh, so I always think, you know, that way also. Yeah. That's such good advice. And too, kind of when you step out on stage, you kind of black out and kind of forget, like, I'm here. And, you know, know. It's, a little, it's good to be present. Well, well there's a thing that the people do. And my, I get teased, my, my good friend, Larry Rajan, he teases me all the time um, because before we walk on the stage of the quintet, he'll go, let's have fun out there. <laughs> and he knows that drives me nuts. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I tell him, the dude, I'm working. I don't know what you're doing. 
you can have fun, but I am working, okay? <laughs> I said, I'm a working man. I said, you go have your little fun. I'm working. But uh, that whole fun thing doesn't work for me. I, I feel like I have a job to do, and, and I am there. I am present. I am there. If something happens where I, you get, you know, you've probably been there. You've had that out-of-body experience. I know if athletes have it, everybody, if you're working and you get to that zone, everybody calls it the zone now, and you're having that out-of-body experience where it's just working, then that's fun, <laughs> okay? But um, up until that point, I am doing, I am there, I am working. So he always says that, ah, let's go have fun, Ruth, and like, I'm going to kill you if you say that again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working. You can have fun. <laughs> oh. Rufus, I wanted to ask about some bassoon pieces or just music in general, just playing, you know, with the Nutcracker, I know, coming up, and the ballet. I, you know, I love, um, you know, Vivaldi, he wrote, what, 39, 40 of these bassoon concertos. But I am in love with the E minor. Um, the E minor and that second movement is to die for. You know, I love that thing. Um, I love Hindemith Sonata. Um, I was told young, or I was told by other, that's a weak piece, but I just don't see it as weak at all. I feel it's an absolute powerhouse. You know, I think Hindemith Sonata is a powerhouse. And, um, that's my view on it. Um, oh, oof. I love Mozart. I love the Mozart Concerto. I think uh, we owe, as a bassoonist, we owe an incredible amount of debt to Mozart. Not just in his concerto, but oh my goodness, all of the, this, every piece he writes, he writes these incredible bassoon parts, you know. It's unbelievable. And his operas are so over the top with bassoon and woodwinds that you just want to explode. My head almost explodes when we're doing, let's say, Figaro or something. Go see Fine Tunes. The tunes, they just make me dizzy that they're, they're so beautiful and so nice and so clever. So clever. We just finished Fidelio. And Fidelio wrote so well for bassoon. I, I mean, you have a principal, you have a principal second, and you have a principal contra player because each one of those parts is solo parts. They are exquisite. Beethoven. I always felt that Beethoven, Mozart, Stravinsky, Tchaikovsky, um, Shostakovich, um, all of the greatest composers, Prokofiev, they write the best bassoon music. <laughs> <laughs> All of the really good composers understand this instrument so well, you know. So, I'll tell you, the first time I played the whole Marriage of Figaro, sitting next to my my colleague here, and, and we're we're going through this opera, and in every tune, I'm turning to him. I'm, oh my God, this is unbelievable. This is exquisite. The next tune, two, three, boom. Every time I turn, till finally he says, would you shut up? It's all good. It's all good, okay? <laughs> so, so, yeah. And I, I've told conductors, you know, I, I told conductors, if you want to study Mozart, study his operas. His operas have absolutely everything you need in them to do his concertos and his symphonies. It's all in his operas. It would be wonderful to hear about your bassoon and always love hearing, you know, um, fun quirks about it, a, the story of how, you know, how you found it and how, how it found you <laughs> um, and, and anything that you'd want to share with us. My bassoon, to you bassoon people, <laughs> bassoon people, nerd of nerds, all of you. <laughs> Is a Heckel bassoon. It's 11,000 series. No, I'm sorry. See, I don't even know. <laughs> Hold on. 
Yeah. Uh, it's a thirteen. It's a thirteen thousand series. Sorry. <laughs> Early thirteen twenty or something. It's a thirty thousand series, and um, my uh, my colleague many years ago, he would always have bassoons on order. They were always coming to the hall, and um, so I got to I got to try them all, you know, and. Um, I think this may have been the second one I bought from him. I mean, I've been playing on this for many years now, 20, 25 years. But um, I I think, this sounds crazy, but <laughs> if you're in love with your horn, if you love your horn, oh, my horn, my horn, my horn, I don't think you're working hard enough. <laughs> You, you know, you have to wring everything out of these things. You push these things to the wall until you hate them. And so <laughs> I've never, I've had three or four bassoons. I've never loved any of them because they're <laughs> always places you want to go. I always love somebody else's bassoon, okay, because I don't know it that well. But when you're pushing, when you're pushing the envelope, um, it's like a reed. One reed is just not good enough for certain things, you know. And and you want to get all these different colors and things and all these different pieces. One day you're, one day you're playing Queen of Spades, Tchaikovsky. The next day you're playing Nutcracker, okay. Um, and you want all these different sounds. So I don't know. I, I, I just feel like if I fell in love with my bassoon, I feel like I'm not working hard enough. I don't know if that means anything, but uh, that's just me. I don't, don't discourage anybody. If you love your horn, <laughs> good for you. I, I envy you, okay? But, uh, yeah. Uh, I think the best thing about this series horn is this is not ivory. So I can travel. <laughs> I don't have to have it broken off. Uh, we can't come back into the country if we have these ivory rings, um, you know. So uh, it's not ivory. Nothing was killed to produce this except a tree. So uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> but um, it's the fingering on this. All of the all of the keys are designed after. Fritz, um, Frederick Moritz from the L.A. Philharmonic. He was the bassoon, principal bassoon player in the L.A. Philharmonic from 1923 to 1973. He was my teacher's teacher. And and I got to hang out with him when he was in his 80s and 90s. I used to hang out with Moritz. I actually owned one of his bassoons. Great guy. But the fingering system, the things that he came up with and the whisper key, things like that, it's all Moritz. It's all that fingering system, you know, for Moritz. It's Mr. Moritz, as I like to call him. Yeah, Mr. Moritz. Fabulous man. Fabulous. So, um, other than that, I guess you'd call it a thick wall bassoon. It's, it's big. You have to sort of have big hands to play this. It's not a little horn. And um, um, so, you know, so it's, it's a love-hate relationship. You know, one of those things. Like any good relationship. <laughs> I'm sorry. The older, I get, the older I get, the sillier I get, you know. Probably Ten years from now. I'm, 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 <laughs> I get the truth. <laughs> And, and Rufus, we have a question um, from Richard. What was your first bassoon and the progression to your present instrument? My first bassoon, I was in junior high school. It was a Puchner. It was a junior high school horn. And uh, they allowed me to keep that Puchner uh, all the way uh, up until, oh my goodness, until I was able to afford my own bassoon. Uh, so, I had that Pugner all the way into City College, I think, and then, and then a miracle happened. A miracle. 
1975, 76, I'm playing with a Joanne Caldwell. Joanne Caldwell <laughs> was a, 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 a fabulous studio bassoon player. And I used to sit next to her in the Watts Symphony Orchestra. I was a kid, you know, she was a professional. Yeah. And I guess she just thought, this is a serious guy, you know? He's not having fun. He's serious. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're working. <laughs> and, and one night, um, she just turned to me. Back in those days, I think the bassoons were $5,000 heckles. That seems like nothing now. But that was a lot of money. I mean, my dad's salary was maybe ten grand a year, right? So it was five grand. And she turns to me and she says, um, Do you want to buy my horn? And I said, uh, no. I said, I can't afford no hat, you know. She says, I will sell you this horn for what I paid for it 10 years ago. 11,000 series. It came to about 2,500 bucks. So we figured it out, you know. My dad, said, we figured it out. So I ended up with 11,000 series, and with that horn, I, I was playing with the Philharmonic L.A., and then I got my job with the symphony with that horn and the opera with that horn, you know. And uh, uh, went on to it. Um, it was 11,000 series, and I went on to a 12,000 series, and now 13. And uh, this is probably my last, my last horn. Not that I love it, but it takes 10 years to get a horn now. So, you know. Uh, yeah, I won't have any teeth in 10 years, so I'm not, <laughs> not going to order a new horn, so, <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, yeah, um, but that's pretty much the progression, 11, 12, 13, pretty much that. I actually had a one, um... I had two at one time, I, and I can't remember if it was a 14 or a late 13. So this is an early 13, it was a, a later 13, and to this day, I don't know if I chose the right one. I, you know, I, always the other one is the one you should have faked. It's always that way, so you just have to live with that. I do. And with bassoon, we can't always take both, you know, or... <laughs> I, can't, I can't live with two bassoons in my house. I can't. <laughs> I will, I, I'm telling you, if I had two bassoons, I would, one night, I would stop on that bridge and jump. <laughs> I went out on the way to work. I should not have two bassoons, okay? Not crossing the bridge at the same time, okay? It's too tempting, but, so, I'm a one bassoon person. Um, if I had more than one bassoon in my house, I would be bananas. <laughs> Yeah, it's one thing with unlimited reads. We got to stick have one consistent thing in our, our. One thing has to stay the same. <laughs> Otherwise, you're nuts. You know, you will go absolutely crazy. Yeah. So just make what you got work. Yeah. And Rufus, this will be our our last question for today. We have a read making question. And um, Richard has asked or, or shared. Ray Nolan was a great read maker and provided for many players. You study, did you study read making with him? Oh my goodness, you knew Ray. Somebody finally that knew Ray Nolan. Um, no, I didn't. <laughs> Ray supplied me, he gave me reads uh, at the time. Um, I never, I never really studied reads. I, I, I remember Bridenthal showed me how to put one together. And that was it. That was the only lesson I had ever had on the reads. And then I just sort of went on my own with my knife and went went to it. And then, you know, I got books. I got I have so many books on remakings. And nothing, nothing actually changed my reads until I got this dog on machine. The tip machine is it changed my life. <laughs> it changed my life. Uh, well, I have so many books. And things on remaking, but it was this machine, the tip machine, that actually was a, for me just like, oh, where was this, you know? So the machinery actually helped me more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I carry a plastic reed, so don't discount that either. Legere. They're good. They're good. Do you use that on the nutcracker, Rufus? <laughs> I, I've never used it. It's okay. you know, it's it's a reed. It's it's like uh, it's like behind glass. Break this in in case you need it. You know, mm -hmm. break this glass and you grab that reed. But it works really well. I, I don't think I've ever done it in a performance, but it works well. And and I keep that thing with me, and I'll break the glass if I need that thing. And it's and I recommend it. I recommend it to students. I recommend it to a lot of people. So uh, because. When you're when you're trying to make a read, you're not practicing, you know. And that's one thing, you know. I remember Moritz used to tell me. He says, you know, keep your read making and your bassoon practicing completely separate. You're gonna make a read, make a read. You're gonna practice, practice. But when you're doing both, you're not getting, you're not doing, you know, you're not concentrating on the read. You're not concentrating on your practicing. So that plastic read can really help you get some good practice in. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And Rufus, thank you so much for your sharing today.